this session on ecotheology and the Pauline Letters, reading Paul through ecological eyes. I guess um, if we have our ecological eyes in focus, when we look at a picture like the one on the screen, um, we notice Paul and his, his expression, we notice the, the sort of uh, uh, hangings, but we also notice um, that there are some um, other things in the picture as well, some things that seem to have leaves and um, uh, depicted in this mosaic picture. So perhaps um, as we look at Paul through ecological eyes, we might attend to the natural world as well. The key um, place that we need to start our reflection on Paul um, and the natural world is in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. So I'm going to um, read it to you and uh, ask you to reflect on it with me. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the, one, by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we, await, we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. This is a very intriguing passage and a really important passage as we start to think about Paul and the natural world, Paul and ecotheology. If you uh, see the picture here, I ask the question, is this, this passage an isolated phenomenon? Is this just a little um, um, uh, island in the sea of, of Pauline theology? Um, and as such, not worthy of further, further discussion? Or is it something different? Could it, um, some, some scholars have thought of it as a strange echo of animism or a strange, um, perhaps Gnostic or strange apocalyptic um, uh, way of, of seeing things. Um, on the other hand, Christians who've been looking for um, an environmental approach to, to the Bible, have picked this passage up and, and all, almost made it into a mantra. So could we call this a mantra for Christian environmentalism? Either way, one could wonder whether this has been an overused and overinterpreted passage. Um, and, uh, and if it is that, then do we need to really think about uh, Paul and the natural world at all, or is this just um, a passing um, figure of speech that Paul uses? I guess the position that I'm taking and that I'm in inviting you to consider today is that um, this passage is actually a key to noticing the substructure of Paul's thought about creation and new creation. This is not just an isolated island in the sea of Paul's thought, but in fact um, is the bedrock um, and leads down to the substructure of what Paul actually means in his eschatological vision. So let's see how we go with that. Some of the exegetical problems that we have uh, from this passage are these. First of all, what is meant by the creation? Hey, is it, it's uh, called in the Greek. Does it mean the non-human creation? Does it mean unbelieving humanity? doesn't mean something else. Various scholars um, over the years, over the centuries, um, have wrestled with this. But um, for the most part today, um, scholars are of the opinion that, it, yes, it is referring to the non-human creation. Another problem, who are the children of God? Remember it says um, that the creation is um, uh, waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Why do they need to be revealed? What does that mean? Who is the one who subjected the creation to futility? Because verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but 
uh, by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. So who is that one? What does futility mean? What is creation's bondage to decay anyway? What, do, what does that mean? Is that the, the, the natural order or something, um, something else, something eschatological? Why does Paul use the image of labour pains? And as we interpret this passage, what are the key intertexts? What are the other texts um, that help us to understand it? Should we be looking towards Genesis 3, 17 to 19, which is where um, the ground is cursed because of Adam? Should we looking, uh, be looking towards Genesis 1, 26 to 28, which um, uh, describes uh, the creation of humankind in God's image, male and female, and gives um, uh, particular centrality to, to humanity. Should we look, be looking at Psalm 8.6, which uh, talks about dominion? <clears throat> or is the, the groaning of creation that's described in our passage connected with the prophetic traditions in which the land or the earth uh, is said to mourn? A um, number of those passages are there on the PowerPoint. Before I answer or address some of those questions, let's think about what the meta-narrative is that's implicit in this passage. First of all, the believer's experience of suffering and hope is set within the larger context of the suffering and hope of the whole creation. There's something profoundly interconnected between the, the suffering that's articulated by um, humanity in this passage and the suffering of creation and that's important. Second, creation is personified and presented as a key player in God's story. It is in fact the subject of all the important verbs in verses 19 to 22. So it's waiting with eager longing, it was subjected to futility, it will be set free, it's been groaning, it's been in travel and these things are a long, long term uh, realities. The passage presents hope that is not redemption from the body, as, is, as, as though we would be sort of lifted out of this material world, but the redemption of the body. Between believers and non-human creatures, there is a solidarity not only of material bodiliness, but also of groaning and hope for future liberation and glory. So the meta-narrative connects creation and humanity and indeed God into the one movement. Now I want to say a few words about futility, mataiotes, which is a word uh, that has um, a lot of currency in, um, in the wisdom tradition and in particular um, we meet uh, the word um, in, um, in, jo uh, in, in Job uh, so it's, it's a word referring to futility, frustration, purp purposelessness, vanity, uh, not being able to fulfil the purpose of its, of its existence. So if the, the whole creation has been subjected to this nonsense, this nothingness, um, uh, it's a very significant, significant thing to say. It actually picks up in um, the verbal form um, sorry, the, the verbal form of this word, um, purposelessness or, or um, futility, occurs back in Romans chapter 121, where it says, For though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile, became futile, same um, base word in the Greek, in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. So somehow creation subjected to this futility and humanity becoming futile because of sin seem to be connected in Paul's thought. And of course, if we look at Romans 1.21, this is connected to idolatry. The, the problem that Paul sets up in those early chapters in Romans is that not only do humans lose their own glory or likeness to God through worshipping the creature rather than the creator, the intrinsic purpose of the created world is also frustrated. So when, when humans worship 
the creation or images, or in fact themselves, they actually um, uh, separate themselves from their own purpose and also alienate creation from its purpose. The creation's divinely intended telos is to bring glory to the creator, but it's not able to do that with hu through human sin. Some points about bondage to decay. Uh, this refers to a, a type of slavery. Bondage is a slavery, and decay um, is a word that can uh, refer to you know, the body's uh, dissolution at burial, decomposition, all of those sorts of things. Uh, it's really the opposite to eternal life. One wonders whether this is just natural decay and death, or the result of human exploitation. But perhaps that's not Paul's question. Douglas Moo puts it this way. He says, Paul's use of this same language in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 50 to contrast the perishable body of this life and the imperishable body of the life to come points in the direction that says decay um, is the inevitable disintegration to which all things since the fall are subject. So it is natural, but it is also the, um, the reality of um, the human condition that um, creation has been subjected to futility through human sin. Human sin has affected creation profoundly. The one who subjected it, um, this is uh, what Paul says in Romans 8.20, and um, some scholars have thought about whether it's God, others have wondered whether it's Adam, um, really it is God who has subjected um, uh, humanity to uh, and, and the whole creation to futility but because of Adam's um, human of, because of human sin Romans 125 talked about this as well because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever so this is, creation is really caught up in um, this process. Brendan Byrne, who's, who's one of the scholars who's written about this, says, God was the agent of the subjection, so the one who did, did the subjecting, but Adam was its cause in the sense of meriting this punishment. Creation as the instrument of divine retribution was compelled to be the innocent victim in the entire transaction. And that's pretty scary, scary language, isn't it? It's a bit, little bit like um, um, abuse language. Creation has been subjected to the kind of breakdown um, that um, follows from humanity's separation from God. And I guess the way I understand that is that humanity uh, in, in, in seeking its own interests and putting itself in God's place has basically used creation for its own purposes and, um, and so uh, exploited creation rather than being in communion with it. There is a profound in biblical interconnection between humanity, creation and God and I imagine uh, on this day um, uh, we've been hearing about that. Isaiah 24 expresses it really well I think. The earth um, this is, uh, it expresses the in interconnection of what happens when humans misuse the earth. The earth shall be utterly laid waste and utterly despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers, the world languishes, languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. So this is a passage um, that suggests earth, pollution, human action and God's, I guess, reaction um, uh, are interconnected. Our passage in Romans goes on to talk about um, uh, the creation in labour pains and it says we know. It's interesting that Paul can be confident that his... Um, uh, the, the recipients in Rome whom he hasn't yet met or many of whom he hasn't yet met will understand that this is actually part of the God's big picture. Um, he says the whole creation is groaning together and is experiencing labour pains together. 
Now strikingly, back in Genesis, labour pains were a distinctively human thing and a distinctively human punishment. But it's, uh, Paul describes creation's groaning in these terms. And it does uh, suggest that humans have passed on their agony to non-human creation. I wonder whether non-human creation has, is sharing this burden with the Spirit. Because when you look at who's groaning in this passage, um, it's not just creation or humans, but creation, humans and the Spirit groaning together. And I wonder also, um, can we notice that this is hopeful pain, as labour pains are often generally hopeful pains. Groaning uh, goes back further in, in, in terms of the um, chapter 8. Uh, we see um, Christians uh, crying out, Abba, Father, in verse 15, and it's the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. There's a scholar, um, Jacob Torbs, who offers a noise analysis linking the, the worship of the Pauline churches in prayer with the blending of suffering and hope articulated in Romans 8. Through this, the experiences and aspirations of non-human cre creation, humanity and the spirit are expressed and brought into harmony. I think the key note is hope. Creation has been subjected to futility, but in hope that the creation itself will be set free from bondage to decay and will obtain the same glorious freedom that we are experiencing or are hoping to experience. Creation's been groaning in labour pains until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we await for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So I think we need to hear the keynote of hope in this vision. In conclusion, uh, this passage shows that the creation is integral to Paul's gospel of liberation. The gospel of liberation is not only for humanity, but for all creation. Paul evokes Genesis, creation's goodness, but also the condition of being cursed subjected to futility because of human action, particularly Genesis 3.17. Paul also evokes Isaiah's vision of a new creation, particularly Isaiah 11, and this theology lies behind his vision of a new creation that we find in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 6.15, which I haven't talked about today. The groaning of creation helps us to glimpse the sinfulness of humanity and the integrated vision of healing and wholeness, which is God's telos for the whole creation. A final word, this is a burgeoning field of research, and here are some of the scholars working in the area, Richard Borkham, Brendan Byrne, David Horrell, Douglas Moo, Murray Turner, uh, Vicky Balabansky, um, and Paul Trebilko, and in particular, this, um, this uh, commentary by Siegfried Tonstadt in the Earth Bible series is a, is a wonderful uh, resource. Thanks so much.